Please take your Bible, turn with me to the book of John, John chapter number one, John chapter number one. So good to have each of you here this morning. John chapter one, out of respect for the word of God, <clears throat> this morning we are going to stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I'm going to stop there and let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the privilege we have. Lord, how good you are to us. Thank you for the local church. Thank you for the fellowship that we may enjoy in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would meet with the Spirit of God. Help us this morning. Lord, we do pray for those that are hurting right now, those that are grieving, those that have needs that, Lord, only you and you alone can meet. And I pray that you would lift. I pray that you would give grace. I pray that you would encourage as only you can. And then, Lord, we pray, oh, God, if there's one here under the sound of my voice that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, O oh, Spirit of God, I pray that you would work in their heart, in their life, that they would be saved today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> you know, the Bible uses many analogies, many words to connect. We think about for the believer. And uh, certainly we are reminded of several in the book of Ephesians. We understand that we have the armor of God. Well, we know that's not literal armor. It's spiritual armor. It is literally Christ. He is our breastplate of righteousness. He is our helmet of salvation and so forth. We, we, we have an analogy there. In both the books of Ephesians and the book of Colossians, we're reminded to put off the old man and is the picture of a garment. It's the picture of clothing. Put it off and put on the new man. And so you have the analogy of clothing. In the books of Matthew and in the book of Luke, we're reminded that Jesus said concerning Jerusalem, and he says he, he identifies Jerusalem as chicks or chickens, little ones. And he says that he would have taken and protected them, put them under his wings in protection. And so we have these analogies. In the book of Corinthians, we understand that uh, the Bible calls the church a body, a body of believers. And we have that analogy. And he also tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 that we are a building built up unto him. All of these words used to picture for us the relationship, the walk, and what God is doing in our lives. Here's the word. In John chapter number one, and the word is word. Jesus Christ is the living word. It is capitalized, capital W, capital O, capital R, capital D. Jesus Christ is the word. And so we look at this this morning and we're reminded of an analogy. Now I've read testimonies of those who have read the book of John they went home, they studied it, and they came out after 30 days or after 15 days or however long it took them. And God used the book of John to impact their heart, to convince, and they were gloriously saved. It's powerful. It's wonderful. But it's not shallow. The book of John, though written with very small words, 
and uh, many uh, single, uh, what's the word, syllabled words here in the book of John, and yet it is deep truth, and the truth is it was written for believers. There's a lot of those philosophers that have tried to read the book of John, and they get to the part of John chapter number one and verse number 14, and they are done. They're saying, ah, no, this isn't for me, because it's not something they can test in a tube in a laboratory somewhere. It's spiritual. It's deep. It's the word of God, the book of John. And somebody said this, there probably should be a sign right before you get into chapter number 14 that simply says, for believers only, all others stay out because it is great truth, it is deep truth, but it is spiritual truth. It's for the believer. John chapter 14 through the rest of the book of John, and it is a wonderful, wonderful book. So this morning as we look at this truth, it is truth that frees, amen. It is truth that liberates truth, that opens the heart specifically to the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of John presents Jesus as God. Matthew is king. Mark is a servant. Luke as man. But John presents him as God, divine God. And so we're going to look at this this morning. I want to look at the introduction of the word. I want to look at the instrument of the word. And then lastly, I want us to look as we get down to verse number 14, the incarnation of the word. All right, will you look with me then at verses 1 through 3 again? In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Clearly, in the introduction here of the Word, John is using this term for Christ, and it is important. It is important. The Greek word is logos. And it simply means, it's translated several times in the Bible, many, many times it is word. Sometimes that it's translated saying. Sometimes it's translated speech, and sometimes it's translated account. But the point is, the idea, the meaning behind it is of speaking or a message or words. As we look at the word here, gives us an understanding of the relationship or relationships, if I can use that, of Jesus Christ with the Trinity, with the Father. And I want us to look, in, as we look at these few verses here, beginning here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now I want us to look at then, first of all, the relationship with God of the Word. And it's simple. It's this. He is God. That's the relationship that he has with the Father, Jesus Christ is God. Verse number two, he said, the same was in the beginning with God. The relationship to God the Father is eternal. It has always existed. He, Jesus Christ, has always been. Oh my. So he's always had this relationship with the Father. In the beginning here, and it's simply before there was anything, before there was any land, universe, planet, you name it, before there was anything, galaxy, it, you go in eternity past, and we find here in the beginning was the Word. Think about it. You think about it this way. Pick a point in eternity past. Just pick a point out there. If you want to go out a thousand years, or a billion years, or a hundred billion, or a hundred trillion or a hundred, one hundred octillion, whatever it is, you, you pick a point in eternity past, and this is what you find. Jesus Christ is there. He always has been. Jesus Christ is eternal. He has always existed. And so he was with the Father. Let me go back to the verse. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. There is the relationship with the Father. And the Word was God. He is. And so we find here 
that this is an incredible thing. And it's so important. Jesus was with God the Father. Therefore, they are separate persons. One God manifest in three persons. Jesus Christ always has been and he's always been with the Father and the Spirit. And it is a profound thing. And we find here it is believers. By the way, the Jehovah Witnesses in their false translation of the Bible say Jesus Christ is a God. Now there is a point that needs to be made right now with that. That friend is polytheism. Many gods. There is only one God. And he is manifest in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ always has been. And so we see the relationship with the Father presented here in these few, first few verses. Jesus is God. By the way, polytheism is heresy. It is absolute heresy. So he has the relationship with the Father and with the Spirit. He is part of the Godhead. Well, what is his relationship with the galaxies? We have the relationship to God, the Father. What about to the galaxies? And we simply say this, he is the creator. He created them. And so we find his relationship with the Father is he is God. We find the relationship with the galaxies. He created them. And we understand it. We've already said he's eternal way before creation. But what is his relation? He created them all. Verse number three. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. He created it all. Everything that we can see. And by the way, he is in control of it. So every little plant and every tree and every type of rock in the crust of this planet, Jesus made it. The air that we breathe and everything about our being and that it functions, its cells and its veins and its heart and its lungs and our eyes and fingers and everything, he made them. He controls all of it. He controls the weather patterns. He does. Now this week it's going to feel like summer. And isn't it wonderful to see the green hue in the countryside now as the crops are coming up and the, the corn plants are about eight inches high and it is just beautiful. And it'll get even prettier. It is. But don't you love this time of year? And it's warming up and it is glorious and praise the Lord for it. God is in control. Jesus Christ is in control of all of it. He controls the rain. He controls everything that we know about our creation. The wind, he controls that. By the way, he controls viruses. He controls it. So I simply want to say this. Look it. We understand and we can trust him. Don't let fear grip your life. Be careful. Be safe. But know this. My life is in the control of Jesus Christ. I will not live a moment longer than he wants me to live. Nor will I live a moment less than he wants me to live. Why? My life is controlled by the creator and your life is controlled by the creator so we have the relationship that he has with god the father he is god god the son we have the relationship with the galaxies he is the creator of all of it and then i want us to look with the excuse me the relationship that jesus has with the gospel and i simply want to say this he is the savior he is the Savior. Look with me at verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He is the Savior. Hallelujah. How wonderful it is. We're not going to get into great depth, so we're just highlighting the reality right now. But he is 
is the Savior. But as many as received him. That word has to do with the idea of believing upon receiving his message, receiving his grace, receiving his gift. It simply means that I am completely resting and depending in him. I have rolled myself, if you will, upon Jesus Christ and his work for us at Calvary's cross. Jesus Christ, eternal God, Jesus Christ, Creator God, Jesus Christ, Savior God. Oh my, you have placed your faith in Him, then you know that you are His child. And the Bible says here, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power. And the word here is not the Greek word dunamis, it's not talking about strength, but it is the word that identifies we have the rights, we have the privileges, we have, we have this authority. He gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. There's the word again, believe, to roll yourself upon. He is the Savior, and He became our Savior by becoming our substitute at Calvary. Taking the sin of all mankind, becoming sin for us, dying, buried, and raised again. So his relationship to the gospel is clear. He is the Savior, period. There is no other way. Baptism won't do it. Church membership won't do it. Your good works will not do it. Jesus Christ is the Savior. This morning we are introduced. Here's the introduction of the word. And it reveals these three relationships in these few verses. Secondly then, the instrument of the word. I want you to go with me to verse number six. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. To bear witness of the light. That all men through him might believe. The Savior is Jesus. The instrument is John. You and I, like John, can be used as an instrument for the Savior to tell others about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Word, but He's no longer here in flesh. He's not here. And so He has an instrument. And he uses individuals, he uses people as his instruments. The mechanic has his tools. The surgeon has his scalpel and he has his tools. The dentist has his tools. I don't know what they are because I'm afraid and I don't go to dentists. But anyway, uh, the architect has tools. The scientist uses instruments to accomplish his goals and the projects that they have and so forth. John the Baptist is an instrument. So let's note here three things. Quickly, the calling of John. Verse number six, there was a man sent from God. He was called by God. He was chosen. He was empowered. He was blessed by God. Now he, he had a unique ministry, and we looked at that on a Wednesday night. What an unusual character and individual John is. But what an instrument in the hand of God. What a tool to reach people with the truth of God's word. And he was called by God. Friend, you and I have a calling. That calling is to come to Christ and to be saved. And that calling is then to be used as an instrument in his hand. Then I want you to note with me in verse number seven, the communication of John. He was chosen to be a witness, a testimony, to give evidence, to give account of what took place. Or what Jesus will do to give an account of it. There were no cameras back then. There were no cell phones. No one could record videos of Jesus. Who he was and what he did. We have his word. But John gave account. And the apostles gave account. And so we tell what God did, has done in our lives. Again, go back to verse number 12. But as many as received him, excuse me, him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you believed on his name? 
Have you been born again? Have you been saved? Have you been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Has your life been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ? Then you can tell somebody what he did. It isn't anything you did. Jesus did it. You didn't have to jump through any hoops. You came as you were, a sinner, deserving nothing. But you came to Christ, and he saved you. You can tell folks, look, I was born in a Christian home, and, and I, I, I heard the gospel. I heard that Jesus loved me. I heard that God had a plan for me. I heard it from the time I was born. I was in church every week from the time I was born. At the age of nine, I was so convinced, so convicted that I came to Christ as a nine-year-old boy. And I asked Jesus Christ to become my savior. Oh my, I received him. He changed my life. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm not saying that I haven't disobeyed him. I'm not saying that I haven't had sin in my life since then. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. What I'm saying is that I was a lost, hell-bound sinner. And Jesus Christ rescued me. He saved me. He delivered me. Oh my, he is preparing a place for me today in heaven. And we're hoping that he comes soon and that we get to head that way. How wonderful it will be. Communicating that simple truth, telling others what Christ has done in your life. Three things concerning John, his calling, his communication. What was he to do? And thirdly is clarification. Note what it says in verse eight, number eight. He was not that light. He's not the Savior. He's not in any way, shape, or form anything unusual or any different from any other man. He simply was sent to bear witness of that light. What is it that you and I are to do? An instrument of the word. First of all, to get saved. Secondly, then to communicate it. Go ahead and tell others. And the clarification is, we're not special in and of ourselves, but we have a message that is so special. We have the privilege, we have the opportunity to tell others about the great Savior Jesus Christ, about eternal God and who he is and what he can do in and through their life. So we have looked at the relationship of Christ with God the Father. He is God. We've looked at his relationship with the galaxies. He's the creator of all. We've looked at his relationship with the gospel. Jesus Christ is the Savior and the only Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The instrument of the word, John the Baptist, his calling, his communication, and the clarification. Thirdly, this morning, then we go to the incarnation of the word. Will you go with me then to verse number 14? Verse number 14. And the word was made flesh. Boom. That's the one that philosophers... That's the one that scientists, that's the one that they cannot handle, they cannot grapple with. How is it that God became flesh? Look, I can't explain it. Take it by faith. It happened. It's real. It is absolutely true. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I know that you know this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. The word dwelt is the idea of tabernacled. You and I live in a tent, don't we? Now, you're thinking, no, I have a nice home. What are you talking about? No, this body. It is simply flesh. It is going to dry up one of these days. It's going to be so old and, and uh, become so diseased that I have to move out. And I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to have a resurrected body. It's just something that I'm dwelling in now. It's not me. It's not the real you. 
It just houses us. And so he dwelt among us. He was housed among us. He lived among us. But it was God in human flesh. Now, as we think about this, he's eternal. He's all-knowing. He's creator. And yet he was born among us. He had a body of human skin, bones, just like ours. Now, the one great thing is that he didn't have a sin nature. He was born of a virgin. That seed of Christ was placed bare placed into the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit of God. But we find here, he became flesh. Now look with me at verse number 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. My, how amazing it is. Go back. Verse number 14, the, the first part again, and I remind you that you and I are an original, aren't we? We are. When you were conceived, that was the very beginning of you. You had no existence before that time. You were, you were a brand new entity. God created you at conception. And, and we understand that. And, and there has never been or never will be someone identical to you. You and I are created. We are made by God. Now, by the way, let me just say this. That's why Spiritism and Hinduism and other beliefs that have reincarnation as part of their theology are wrong and unscriptural unbiblical you and I when we were conceived we were brand new we had never existed before what we find here Jesus had he's always existed when he was conceived within the womb of Mary he is eternal and always has been and when he was conceived in the womb of Mary, we understand that he is unique. And he, God, took on the form of a human being. It is amazing. And so what a miracle what God did for us that day. Now let me just stop and back up here. That's why abortion is murder. Because at conception, you and I were a brand new perfect, living thing made by God, created by Jesus Christ. Enough of that. We'll move on. The word here is divine like the Father. And the Bible says that we have beheld here, we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. This is amazing. We beheld his glory. And so here's the glory of the Father, the unseen spirit. This is something that man has never seen, never known. And yet God came in human flesh. And we beheld his glory, the beauty of God, the attributes of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the power of God. Here he is. In the person of Jesus Christ. And oh, that leper that Jesus touched and was healed. The power of God. Oh, the grace of God when the adulteress came in and was found in the very act. And Jesus forgave her. The power, the forgiveness, the love, and the grace of God in Christ. Because he is God. What a perfect image of the glory of God the Father. And we find here full of grace and truth. And so we find here this, this morning as we look at the introduction of the Word, the instrument of the Word, and the incarnation of the Word. And in it we see that He came and dwelt among us. We find here the fullness of God the Father, the glory of God the Father. 
And those last two words, full of grace and truth. I want to just simply make this statement. He, Jesus Christ, delivers. He delivers. Now, you can, you can use that many ways, but I, I would simply want to close with this, this thought with it. He delivers us from the penalty of sin. He delivers us, therefore, from hell. He delivers us from the power of sin and its dominion over us. He delivers us from the guilt of sin. He delivers us from being bound to our flesh. He delivers us from emotional strongholds and and fears. Jesus Christ delivers. May I say something to you today? Our God is colorblind. God sees no color. What has created racial tension and color problems is Satan and sin. What causes all of the unrest and the hatred and the anger and the frustration in our world? Jesus Christ delivers from that. The answer is not in destroying. The answer is in Jesus Christ. The answer is not in a different government. The answer is in Jesus Christ. He is absolutely colorblind. He loves every soul. Jesus says, for God so loved the world. Not a group. Not a country, not a color. He loves the world. And the only hope for our nation to be restored is when we look back to God. When we look back to Jesus Christ. The answer, it's Jesus who delivers but as many as receive him. It says, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the word Jesus is introduced to us, John 1, 1. There's God in human flesh. His relationship to the Father, he is God. His relationship to the universe, he created it. To the gospel, he is the Savior. John was called to be a witness. Let us this week be a witness. And we're going to have opportunity. We're going to have opportunity. Look at everywhere you go this week, what's going to be the talk? You're going to have an opportunity to be a witness. And the incarnation and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you been saved? If not, today he's ready to save you. He went to the cross for you. He died, was buried, and he was raised again. You can be saved and have it settled today. Christian, we've, given, we've, we've been given answers. We've been given the truth. Let's be a witness. Give account of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word, the authority of your word. Thank you for the word, the living word. God in human flesh. Oh, how blessed we are today. How blessed we are. Oh, my Lord, we have no idea where, where things are going. It is it's sad. And it's crazy. And there's emotions that are out of control. And there's anger, frustration. 
And the answer's in you. The answer's in you. Lord, I pray that you would help us today to reflect on you, to live for you, to honor you in our walk. Lord, we ask now that you would protect us and bless us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.